There's a new book out that chronicles the Flint water crisis and the government's role in the lead poisoning of the city's drinking water. The book's titled Poison on Tap, How Government Failed Flint and the Heroes Who Fought Back. It provides the first comprehensive look at the tragedy through a compilation of journalism reports from Bridge Magazine, which is the bi-weekly news and analysis publication from the Center for Michigan. Here to tell us about the book is contributing reporter Chastity pratt Dossi of Bridge Magazine. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, one of the things I love about this book is that it really is like a timeline. I mean, it's like a narrative from the very first reports of something seeming like it was wrong with the water and Flint up through sort of the present day. And you really do get a sense of uh, how many opportunities there were for somebody to stand up and say, something's not right here. Uh, you really do get a sense of even when uh, people knew something was wrong that they didn't do what was supposed to happen. And then you see sort of uh, parallel along that is this immense suffering that is visited Absolutely. upon the people of Flint. Absolutely, and that's the thing. People are gonna be able to look at this book years down the line and say, what happened? Oh wait, let me turn to this page right. and I can figure, find out what happened. Who said what, when, when did this trend? It's a wonderful, just chronological recording, just the facts of what happened and when. And it's really important because, you know, years down the line, you know, people start to try and rewrite people forget, history. forget, right, <laughs> on purpose. They forget on, on purpose. purpose, as we might exactly. say, right? Exactly, <laughs> and this, I mean, we're, we're still in the crisis. So to put everything down that we know to date and continue to add the facts as they come, as, as things happen, that's really important. Yeah, uh, the other thing that you guys do in this book that's, that's really key is, uh, a function that you guys uh, perform during political campaigns normally, and that's the the truth squad, right? right. Uh, looking at what people say and comparing it to what actually happened or comparing what they said to maybe what they said before. Right. Uh, and you find lots of instances here where the truth is something different than what we were told. Absolutely, the Bridge Magazine Truth Squad, We we it's sort of like we go in and we look at what people said and what the facts are and compare the two, not so much to catch people in a lie, but to uh, give context to what people are saying and to, you know, just basically lay out where people might be fudging yeah. or, you know, purposely leaving out context and details. And um, in, in the instance of this book, we allow um, the truth squad to come in and analyze some of the emails. Oh, this is what they really meant when they said, you know, uh, we didn't know anything, right. <laughs> you know, right. and, and we refer back to future and past emails to, to sort of give context to what governor, government officials were saying when they were saying saying it and whether the, they were telling the full truth or leaving out in, in yeah. important detail. Uh, do you feel like the book gives people a better sense of uh, the shared responsibility and to what extent it is shared? Uh, I mean, that's been one of the things that we've argued a lot about is who is exactly at fault? Was it the emergency manager? Right. Was it the Department of Environmental Quality? Was it the EPA? Was it the governor staff who sort of sitting back watching all this stuff happen? Uh, in these departments and on these emails for so long didn't respond. Do, do people get a better sense of, of where they should put the blame? This book lays out the accountability across the board. Where did MDEQ go wrong? Where did the governor's people go wrong? Where did the governor go wrong? Where did the emergency manager go wrong? I mean, when you lay out the entire chronology and all of the emails and everything people said, it becomes sort of clear, but the truth squad steps in to say, here you go, right here, this is where the MDEQ went wrong. Right. And, and so uh, the, the blame or the accountability that is shared by everyone who has come into contact with this from a governmental standpoint yeah. is laid bare. Yeah. Uh, one of the questions that people ask me all the time about this is the role that the emergency manager law played mm -hmm. in, uh, in switching the drinking source to the Flint River um, and whether whether having displaced the elected officials, that there weren't the kinds of checks and balances in place that you might have had if it were right. for the mayor. Now, right. of course, the mayor of Flint uh, is, I've seen pictures of him uh, drinking uh, Flint water, mayor. water, yeah, the former mayor, the Dane Walling, drinking out of a glass, talking about how great it was to switch, but it, he was not in control. Uh, at the time, uh, Darnell Early was. Absolutely, and what we talk about too is not so much who decided to make the switch. I mean, you know, there's argument, oh, the, the council has some culpability in that as well. 
really what we talk about is who decided that we would not use anti-corrosive chemicals? Well, right, and that's the key decision. <laughs> right, that's right. That's the key decision, and there were city um, officials and, and uh, as we know now, vendors or contractors in on all of that, and so th there has been a question. If you had a, a city council that was really involved, would they have been able to examine and sound off on all and of that? And think it through. And think it through as well, so that's all in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things the book does also is focus on the people who, from the beginning, said, this is a big deal mm -hmm. and I gotta get people's attention. Uh, and it's not just it's not just powerful people who did that. In some cases, it's really uh, people on the outside of the decision-making process who were the ones who pushed uh, hard enough to get people to respond, to get the media to right. take notice, right. uh, talk the about, heroes that you guys... You talk uh, about powerful people, the, the citizens, the regular everyday folks who were just disempowered by the emergency manager mm -hmm. uh, situation, took back the power and said, look, this water's not good. We don't care what you say. And right. they, It's brown. It it's, smells. It's brown. Who wants to drink brown water? Right. And for a long time, you know, we, everyone knows that was ignored. But when they got the attention of the ACLU, when they got the attention of Mark Edwards, when they got the attention of uh, Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha, yeah. you know, people who did have some um, ability to, you know, test the water right, right. <laughs> and look See at the lead on. testing for the children, yeah. then we really know and, and understand just how powerful the regular folks in Flint were yeah. in making this and saving their selves. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned testing the water. Uh, of course, those tests led us to understand that there was a, a, a unacceptable level of lead in the, in the drinking water, and that has a really profound effect, of course, on mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. if they drink it. But there's a lot of other things going on with the water in Flint, and you wrote a story uh, this week in Bridge about uh, the fact that we really haven't reached a final conclusion about all of those things that, that, that the Legionnaires issue and some other health issues may end up being connected to, to the water. Supply. Absolutely. And the thing about um, the book is that we're able to update it. You know, right. uh, Shooty filed a civil lawsuit last week. We're able to the update General, that, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Attorney General. Um, and the story that I wrote this week, we're going to update the book in a month or so and put this story you put in that the in book there, as right. well. Okay. And people, when they buy it a month or so, they'll have you know an updated version. We're going to keep doing this. It's, right. it's a living thing. It's a different way of uh, publishing a book. Absolutely. It's very twenty first um, century. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the story that we ran uh, this week it talks about the case of Bertie Marble and. She She's the matriarch in a well-known basketball family in Flint. Everyone in Flint knows this family. They've had uh, two uh, NBA players and legendary basketball players. And uh, she died around, the, well, in the, the middle of the Legionnaires crisis. She died at McLaren. And the, the questions that are raised by her case and raised in our story are, really, do we know how many people died from Legionnaires? Why is it that no one is talking about the increase in pneumonia and flu deaths that happened during the crisis? 60% unprecedented jump in those people dying during the crisis. And uh, some experts will say, well, you know what? When you look at Legionnaires and the, the confirmed cases, the 91 confirmed cases are definitely the tip of the iceberg. There were more people. There are more people. There are more people out there. And very definitely some of those people who died of, of pneumonia could have been Legionnaires people who died because of the water. Right. Uh, one of the things that's frustrating about this is, of course, that we don't see the state or state officials seeming to pivot the way they should to try to figure that out. I mean, it's almost as if they're not, they're still not asking the right questions. Is that, is that a It fair appears assessment? as if they're not asking it, but we don't know because they won't answer our questions. They won't say anything <laughs> to you anyway, it's right? It's sort of like when the Legionnaires outbreak was going on, they're not really talking a lot about what's going so on. So whose job is that? I mean, who's, whose responsibility is it to say, hey, look, there's a spike in pneumonia deaths in Flint during this time period. I don't know, maybe it has something to do with, with the water. Who's, who's the person who should be making that connection? Well, very definitely, Legionnaires is a reportable disease, so the health, state the health, health department, department. Yeah. <laughs> and county health department. Right. And, um, you know, if you're talking about water, you're talking about MDEQ. Yeah. You're talking about all of these agencies that have treated this situation like a hot potato from the very beginning. They're all involved in trying to, or not trying to figure out whether or not these pneumonia deaths are also part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, speaking of trying to change our behavior, talk about some of the lessons that you think are evident in the book about the way we ought to be managing government and public health in, in Michigan based on this crisis. Uh, 
uh, one of our staffers, Nancy Derringer, says, you know, treating government like um, it's a business is like, you know, confusing yeah. a horse with a dog. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've repeated this. This is a great <laughs> line. And that's what we saw happen here. You were treating uh, the emergency manager law was treating the system as a business and democracy the money? was suspended in a lot of ways. And that lesson is continuing <laughs> to haunt us today. Mm -hmm. You know, the emergency manager is gone, but living with this Flint water crisis is very definitely have uh, effect of having lived through emergency management and, yeah. and the suspension of, of democracy to a large degree. And, and they say in Lansing that we're going to revisit that. We haven't really seen them do it yet, right? Uh, we, we have it, and um, th this is the Republicans' baby. They have to own it because the people of, in the state of Michigan said they didn't want an emergency right. manager law, and the they state turned back. around and brought it back. Right. So it's, you know, it's, it's at their feet to deal with. All right. Uh, thanks very much for being here. And we'll look for more updates in the book. Thank you. All right.